Thank you so much for joining us today on Connect and Collaborate, where we come together each day to introduce you to our network of business and community leaders and to discuss important issues that impact business in Colorado and the region. I'm Tammy Schaefer, your on-air producer, and today we're connecting with Vital for Colorado. Peter Moore, Chairman and CEO of Vital for Colorado, is here uh, joining us today. Peter, it's great to have you back. Well, hi, Tammy. Thanks a lot. Uh, here we are a week before Christmas weekend. And yeah. It's got to be close to 70 degrees outside and sunny, and uh, <laughs> I don't know about you, but it's been a long week, and I'm really glad the weekend's here. It has been a long week. I don't know what exactly makes one feel longer than the other, and maybe it's the anticipation of uh, the holidays coming Well, for me, it. it's the anxiety of uh, anxiety. not really starting my Christmas shopping, but... Uh, Apparently, my husband's in the same position, and I'm about halfway done, so we got to get on the ball. So, I think I'll find your husband out there uh, <laughs> in uh, shopping land. Um, we are who's the Vice President of Communications for the Solar Energy Industries Association. Dan, how are you? Great, Peter. How are you doing? Hi, Tammy. How are you? Wonderful. Thanks so much for being with us. Well, I'm thanks for to be here. Well, thanks for joining us uh, this time of year. It's, uh, I know it's, uh, it's a hard break. I think we're actually catching you on your day off, so thank you again for doing that. Um, uh, Dan um, uh, works... Um, and oversees all internal and external communication efforts uh, for the Solar Energy uh, Energy Industries Association. And part of that, he was he really comes to uh, this as being an environmental journalist, and he had a stint as the director of communications for the American Natural Gas Alliance. So I think you've got a very unique uh, uh, skill set, uh, Dan. Well, I guess when it comes to energy and the environment, I've I've uh, touched on just about everything. I was a journalist for about 17 years, covering pretty much strictly uh, energy environmental issues. So I've really been lucky to be exposed to a little bit of, of all of it, and it's been a lot of fun. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Solar Energy Industries Association, uh, who its members are, and what and what the mission is, and, and what uh, folks at your association are primarily working on. Sure. Um, well, we uh, basically represent the entire supply chain of the solar industry um, and across all sort of um, um, segments of it. So we represent rooftop uh, companies that put uh, solar on houses and businesses. Uh, we represent the big utility sale scale businesses. Um, how we represent, uh, you know, companies that make tracking devices, that make, uh, you know, racking systems. And so really every part of the solar industry. And in that, in that sense, um, you know, it's a real balancing act to make sure that we're representing everybody and representing everybody's views. And so that's been, uh, it's been a challenge and it's been, uh, it's also been a lot of fun. It's been a real collaborative situation in its own right. You know, matters in solar and I've just been, Watching it for a number of years as uh, as a consumer, and uh, I read a lot in terms of science because uh, I guess I don't like the fractiousness in politics. Uh, uh, but in uh, solar, there's been so many innovations uh, during the last number of years, and I think of the game, and this might not be the way that you look at it, uh, but I just look at it in terms of efficiency of the solar cells themselves, and uh, it has really gained in the last five years. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, the the growth of the industry has been mind-boggling over the last five years, and I think a lot of that is uh, because of the efficiencies that we brought into the systems. I mean, uh, just look at the profile of the rooftop systems. They're so much smaller and, um, you know, thinner, and uh, they look a lot better, um, and they're, ton they're a lot more efficient. You can, like I said, put tracking systems so that uh, you just don't have it flat, but that you're you're tracking the sun with the uh, uh, turn of the panel. So um, it's it, it, innovation has been a huge part of it. And all of this results, uh, at least uh, in terms of the reduction uh, in terms of kilowatt hour. I think that's the measurement, perhaps. Uh, and then from the solar folks, uh, it's it, it's kind of a double-edged sword, though, uh, because normally from a consumer's point of view, you would look at the reduction as uh, of energy if it were provided by the utility as being a great thing. But next thing, you're the guy who's providing the electricity. You're the guy that's providing the power, and uh, it's not so easy an answer. 
Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I guess I'm, I'm not sure what you what you mean there. I'm, I'm, well, I was just thinking real. I, got, I was thinking really simply uh, about the uh, efficiencies uh, resulting in the drop uh, in the uh, cost per kilowatt hour and how that affects uh, the oh, yeah. various various yeah. folks in the solar industry. The the folks who are putting the roofs out solar on the consumers who uh, wish to sell it back, you know, I don't know how many states well, yeah. in the country, a, a, a lot net metering, but it, 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 it's it, it's a much more complicated equation, I think, with solar than it is if you're looking at uh, at a regular utility. That's all I was thinking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's net metering is a big part of it. They have net metering in, in uh, more than 30 states. Um, and we're constantly trying to or having to battle with cost competition uh, you know, with other fuels as well. So, um, yeah, the cost of electricity going down for consumers forces us to con constantly be f finding new efficiencies ourselves. And uh, actually, we've had a lot of success on that front. Um, but it's it's an ongoing challenge, really, for for every fuel source. That's probably a good way to put it. Is that uh, uh, energy cost drops cause providers to uh, have to innovate? more um, strongly that's absolutely true yeah and you see it I mean you really see it and those fuels that have innovated um, certainly natural gas is one of them winds another one have really done well in the last five years and those that have uh, not had an easy time doing that uh, are, are struggling Dan we just have about 30 seconds for this segment what are the uh, major challenges facing the solar industry today well, uh, gosh, in 30 seconds, I can't get into the full impact of a trade case that we're fighting. But essentially, <laughs> so there we'll, are... So, so we'll carry on about your trade case uh, <laughs> next segment. Uh, that was an unfair okay. question. All right, that sounds good. So a couple of them are the trade case. We have tax reform that's just going through uh, tonight, uh, a new version. And then there is, um, you know, administrative actions with regard to nuclear and coal in comparison with all the other forms of energy and those are the three big things we're looking at right now great thank you dan witten we'll be back with more here on connect and collaborate with vital for colorado thanks guys have you along today here on Connect and Collaborate as we connect with Vital for Colorado. Peter Moore, Chairman and C CEO of Vital for Colorado, is joining us today along with Dan Witten, Vice President of Communications for Solar Energy Industries Association. Well, thanks a lot, Tammy. Just a real quick uh, plug for Vital for Colorado. We're uh, an advocacy group um, for energy, rational energy policy is what we think about it. We try to advocate that from the perspective of the, of the business community. We're run by our board of directors, uh, many of which are CEOs of various chambers of commerce. I'd like to find out more about our work, please go to our website, which is www.spelledoutvitalforcolorado.com. Uh, and as part of the all of the above energy, uh, we're very happy today to be talking to Dan Witten, the VP for Communications for the Solar Energy Industries Association. Dan, I have to apologize. I, I think at the last segment I said, tell me about your major issues in 30 seconds, and then we sort of cut you off. Um, and uh, so apologize for that. But um, one of your major issues is, is really the uh, solar import tariffs. And Vada for Colorado very recently uh, weighed in in terms of a, a, a letter that we drafted, and I think I signed, and a research fellow, a former co-worker of yours, uh, Simon Lomax, wrote an op-ed about. Um, but why don't you just explain what the uh, solar import tariff issue is and why it's important and uh, why all of the above energy uh, rational business people like Vada for Colorado uh, weighed in in support of your position. Yeah, it's been an amazing um, case, and we really appreciate the support of Vital for Colorado. Essentially, um, two companies that have foreign headquarters filed a petition to get trade protection from imports from all over the world. So you have two bankrupt companies that were looking to impose tariffs on solar panels from every other country in the world. The effect of that would have been to double the price of solar panels, um, cut as many of, as 80,000 jobs in our sector, which is about a third of all our jobs. Um, as, as you know, you know, dealing with all these different energy sources, 
uh, you, margins are really thin, uh, and you can't really afford to add five percent to the cost of your energy, let alone fifty percent. And so, um, it, the tariffs would have a have a terrible impact on uh, solar. Uh, would cost us jobs. Would cut the uh, new capacity we produce each year by about a third, and uh, make us, you know, uh, much less competitive with other fuels. And also, as you mentioned, you know, um, our electricity grid is going in a completely different di direction. And uh, working together with natural gas and wind, um, solar, you know, there are places where nuclear makes sense. Um, uh, Solar can play such a critical role, especially, um, you know, when there's uh, storms, when there's power down. Uh, solar has been a real sort of rock in terms of producing electricity. And so um, it would be really disappointing to have these um, tariffs uh, upset the market the way that they would. Well, for a long time ago, my college degree was actually in international economics in the early 1970s. And... And the idea of terrorists really runs contrary to so many different things that are current uh, in our current society. Uh, you know, generally speaking, you look for economic efficiency. You're looking for people being able to trade freely, uh, and uh, so terrorists actually impede that uh, directly. And as you pointed out, uh, it it would cost tens of thousands of jobs in an industry that. The majority of the country, as best I can tell, has been going great efforts to try to support and try to grow. And in Colorado, for example, uh, it's an important element of our overall mix of energy. And all these energy sources really work together in conjunction with each other. And and uh, I think the people that are running the utilities are trying to make that happen. And then just to take one of those industries out, which I think if you would, would increase the cost, by as much as 50% would be, you know, contrary to almost every policy I can think of. Yeah, we, we you know, we generated about $23 billion in economic activity, direct economic activity in the industry, and really uh, tariffs amount to imposing a tax on the, our, our own product, you know, on products that we're trying to buy to, to put into the economy to create those jobs and why you would want to impose that sort of tax on the products that you need and use, I, I, I don't know. But also, uh, after about 15, 20 years of national effort to uh, try to support all of the industries, including uh, solar, um, it, it's um, so we oppose it, and uh, I hope that you're successful in your trade case because it's just just the wrong economic thing to do, and. And our members here in Colorado um, strongly oppose the tariffs and, and do support the uh, solar industry and hope it becomes successful. Yeah, well, we expect to, to hear uh, by the end of next month what the um, – this is a decision that gets made by the president. Um, and um, it, it's, it's very complicated, and we expect to hear by the end of, uh, end of next month what the, what the president will decide. You know, for uh, for us, you know, yeah. just quickly for us, it's it's a pretty stark choice. You you either choose those uh, forty thousand or fifty thousand workers, whatever the number is, depending on what the tariff is, or you choose these two bankrupt companies because th th there is there is no wave of manufacturing and tens of thousands of manufacturing jobs that are coming in. We already employ thirty eight thousand manufacturing pe workers. And those people would be hurt by these tariffs. So it's a real stark choice for the president. We, we hope that he, you know, we think putting America first means uh, keeping these jobs, these good paying jobs in place. Well, we hope so, too. And um, really to sort of step back a little bit, uh, uh, many people, you know, seem to want to pit one side versus another side. And in particular, uh, it, it seems to be a political football to try to pit fossil fuels against renewables. Uh, but the reality is actually just the opposite. Uh, I long have looked uh, at solar and natural gas, for example, as being complementary. And uh, I think I've, uh, to use a $5 word, I think I've uh, 
read uh, a statement by either the current president of your organization or a prior president saying that there's symbiotic uh, that there's symbiotic uh, that there are symbiotic industries. What's your view on that? And and if you agree with that, can you elaborate on that? Sure. I mean, um, I think it's one of those great situations where um, the different fuels really, they do compete like heck on price. Sure. And, um, you know, we're in there trying to make the case that solar is the best choice in a lot of different circumstances. But, um, and, there, and there are some people in the solar industry that want to be 100% renewables or want to be 100% solar. But the reality is that... Um, Natural gas and solar are very complementary. The reason for that is that, um, you know, gas is really, really flexible. And so you can turn it off and turn it on quickly. Um, solar and wind are working on developing much stronger. In fact, all energy sources are working on much stronger storage technologies um, that will take away some of the intermittency of, of solar and wind. The fact is right now that um, solar produces in the day. And so in places like California, where there's a ton of solar, you got to be able to ramp that gas up and down very quickly. And California is the, the biggest example where solar, um, sort of has, uh, integrated into that system. But, but other states have different balances and in many states, natural gas plays a much, much bigger role and solar plays a much smaller role. So, um, there's room for growth in solar. And uh, but it doesn't happen without uh, natural gas's ability to work in that complementary way. Well, here's a real simple example that I think about, and uh, this might change uh, to the extent that large scale, uh, I guess, grid scale storage comes on. But that's quite a while away, as best I can tell. But right now, uh, in the evening, let's say we get into a world where there are a lot of electric cars and you would like to come home and charge your electric car, and you'd like to use the solar as your renewable source, well, the sun's not shining when you get home. And uh, during that time period, you need the fast uh, firing and the fast acting natural gas uh, uh, plants, and then during the evening, actually, wind comes online. Uh, so all these work together uh, to support each other and to meet these various goals of 20%, uh, 30% renewable, uh, uh, those percentages, and, and some states in the future have much higher percentages, they can't work without all of them working together. Yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely been the case. Um, you know, again, uh, storage might change the equation a little bit, but uh, I think, that, you know, for the, for the foreseeable future, I mean, you know, we're in a world right now where, where we're cutting back on our use of nuclear and, and, and coal. And, and so we're going to need every energy source that, that there is um, to make up for that. So what should we uh, keep an eye on with regard to the solar industry uh, in the year uh, 2018 beyond? Well, I think first thing is the, the outcome of this trade case. And That's then the second too, thing, yeah. and then the second thing is, um, how much will the trade case uh, affect our business? What will, if there are tariffs, what will their number be? Um, will it be something that our industry can can uh, can sort of absorb? Uh, I think even with the tariffs, th this is a the, the policy only lasts for four years. The reason for it is it's it's supposed to establish an industry within a foreseeable amount of time. If it doesn't happen within four years, then the, then the relief. Uh, terminates and so the long-term view of solar is really really strong and you look into the 2020 21 22 uh, we think solar will get uh, continue to get cheaper will continue to innovate and will continue to play a huge role in the power sector along with uh, you know other sources well thanks like a lot Dan Witten VP of communications the solar energy industry association thanks a lot y'all staying with us today here on Connect and Collaborate. We are connecting with Vital for Colorado. Peter Moore, Chairman and CEO of Vital for Colorado, is here with us today. And John Ekstrom is stepping in now. We're going to do a little year in review. Huh? That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. Well, it's fun. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on this year, and I appreciate you uh, spending a few minutes, I guess, uh, for this segment and next segment to talk about maybe about five or six or seven or 
where I come from, a couple three, uh, back, <laughs> back in New York, you might say, uh, things that have uh, happened. And I think it's been a pretty eventful year. Uh, it's indeed been an eventful year. And it's funny, having worked in this, Vital was founded in 2013. Yeah. And if you go back to 2012, uh, you know, one of the impetuses had to be the, the case in Longmont, where Longmont voted to ban fracking. And as of recently, a lot of those Supreme Court cases have asserted that you can't do that locally. Yet, this is a movement that seems to not die. You know, that's probably uh, a, a good example. And we're kind of getting out of sequence what you and I mm. talked beforehand. But let's sort of tackle uh, that first, because to me, that's just kind of fascinating mm -hmm. in terms of what happened. Um, and, and John, uh, I, please correct me because I'm just thinking about this in terms of really broad strokes. You probably know more details than I do. Oh, I'm just a simple country lawyer, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, there were two uh, Colorado Supreme Court cases, mm -hmm. and uh, they were based on those earlier cases, and, and those are bans and moratoria. And the essence of the two rulings uh, was on the basis of a legal prin principle called preemption. Yes. And it was state preemption. And then the predicate for that is that if it's a matter of statewide concern, then the state government in this case, the federal government for matters of federal concern, mm -hmm. um, have preeminent power to regulate. And if you really get into preemption, it's not only for what they do regulate, what they could regulate. Right. Okay. Um, so... Um, it's uh, kind of a subtle ruling. So that's a law, as best as I understood it. And we spent a lot of time, actually, this year talking about that and bringing people in that knew about it. So <laughs> fa fast forward to the election that just happened in, in Broomfield. And I've got a question coming, so don't worry. Okay. <laughs> uh, but in Broomfield, um, uh, there is a, uh, a ballot initiative for the city council that actually said that the city council has plenary power mm. uh, to grant oil and gas permits. And that's kind of a, a tricky word in the sense that probably not a lot of people know exactly what it means, but what it means is superior, mm. uh, the final power, the best power. It's good power to have, as they would say. <laughs> and uh, the city attorney ha who had been working on all these issues, and he was no friend of the oil and gas industry. He'd actually had spent five years uh, fighting for the citizens of Bloomfield, and but he knew what the Supreme Court ruled, and he said, "Do not pass this ballot initiative because if you do, you'll get sued. You being the city uh, citizens of Bloomfield, and you'll pay a lot of money and you'll lose, right?" Yes. So what happened? Uh, I think that the initiative, it's called 301, passed by 57 percent. Uh, and I I have heard that I I'm independently verified this, but I've heard from studying that that city attorney had been working for the city for quite a long time. Uh, he's either has been replaced or is going to be replaced. Uh, and I am, uh, I don't get it. So John explain it to me. What <laughs> happened here? Well, what what's interesting is, and I think this goes hand in hand. I, I mean, we're talking about Broomfield. Broomfield was a real hot spot mm. in oil and gas in 2017. And before we talk about 301, I think what's important to note is the MOU that was reached in Broomfield, because that should be viewed as a real success story. And when you talk about preemption... So MOU stands for Memorandum of Understanding. It's a legal document in correct. this context between the city of Broomfield and somebody who wishes to develop resources. And I think uh, the company that wanted to develop resources is the aptly named Extraction Resources. <laughs> correct. And the, the difference is... When you talk about preemption, it's important to note that the state has final say over these, but that does not mean that local governments don't have an important role. And an MOU is different than creating new rules and regulations that step on state authority. That's a private agreement between the government and companies that says, <clears throat> look, we're willing because we want to develop here. We think we've got a valuable you know, piece of acreage. We've got a development plan that we want to do and we're willing to go above and beyond state regulations to meet the requirements of the community and the mou that was put together by extraction and broomfield was the culmination of a two-year process 
that basically said, let's listen to the community. Let's try and minimize our impact. Let's do this in a way to where we can develop these resources safely and responsibly. And the community has a minimum of impact. Uh, and that ended up passing uh, in a six to four vote by the S Broomfield City Council. Now, br uh, just about ten days to two weeks before the election, I think. Right. That's right. Yeah. It was. It was very soon before the election. That to me almost negated what 301 was hoping to accomplish. And so the fact that Broomfield citizens still felt inclined to pass this, despite what happened with the MOU between Extraction and City of Broomfield, as well as uh, the warnings from their own city attorney and the state attorney general, uh, to me, you're right. It's In some ways, it's mystifying. Well, you're supposed to explain it to me. You weren't supposed to say it's <laughs> mystifying. <laughs> hey, I'm the context guy, all right? So okay. here, here's our field of play, and here's what happened. Here's what led up to that. Um, Peter, I think what you have is... Uh, it speaks to a very charged environment as it pertains to oil and gas. And despite what happened in 2012, 2013, 2014, every year there is uh, a new sort of field of play, but it all comes back to a certain desire, uh, and I would say a lot of this is being funded by outside interests, out-of-state out of interests that for whatever reason want to shut down the oil and gas industry. They come in with some inflammatory rhetoric. They come in with a plan. They say, here's a way to get oil and gas out of the state. And I, I think in some cases, local citizens end up being sold a bill of goods. Mm. You know, and really to amplify, I think what, what you said is that although the state government, in this case it's the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, has primary authority, uh, it is primary authority, but it is delegated already and already built into the entire process right. is a great degree of local control. And included within that local control is the ability of any city government to negotiate privately between government and uh, extractor, in this case it was ext extraction oil, uh, raise regulations, and those can can be uh, far well. Those can be uh, greater than people would anticipate, and they can exact a great degree of local lo lo control. So, really, to sort of summarize, is that within about ten days of probably the best example of statewide success of a city government uh, exercising local control successfully after two years of negotiations and quote unquote getting a lot for citizens, the citizens then uh, voted for a resolution which surely is, um, of course I want to say surely, uh, um, and no airplane jokes please, but uh, <laughs> uh, getting there. Uh, the, uh, as was I. <laughs> the, uh, uh, for something that will likely result in a lawsuit. I don't know if it has or not, but it, it, it'll result in a lawsuit fairly soon. Well, if if history is our guide, I, I would say that the likelihood of that is very strong. And I can't imagine that the uh, Colorado Supreme Court will uh, undo the two cases that people call similar cases right. just last year. So the, the result is uh, probably predictable. Uh, so I conclude that... Uh, the, the folks in Broomfield were trying to send somebody a message. Right. And uh, I'm not sure what that message is. It, uh, it's, you know, uh, broadly speaking, it's sort of, what's the message, John? I, I, I'm not entirely sure what the message is either, but um, I think we can get into that more in the next segment because Perfect. we've also got to talk about Thornton, and uh, we'll talk about some of the successes experienced by Vital for Colorado as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. We're talking with Vital for Colorado. Peter Moore, Chairman and CEO of Vital, is here. And John Ekstrom is here to help uh, recap the year in review with Vital. Stay with us. Thanks so much for staying with us today on Connect and Collaborate. We are happy to be collaborating and connecting with Vital for Colorado. Peter Moore, Chairman and CEO of Vital, is joining us today. And we're glad to have John Ekstrom with us as well. Well, thanks a lot. I'm also a partner with the Robinson Waters That's and right. Dershow Law Firm, and uh, uh, John works with me, but he uh, independently uh, also is the president of Deaf Communications, and uh, I think he won the uh, award last year for the best, 
best podcast in Denver. That's true. I also host the John of All Trades podcast, which you can find at John of All Trades. That's J-O-N of all trades dot U-S. Oh, cut it. I wasn't trying to tee you up. <laughs> yeah, well, he took it. <laughs> hey, you know what? you got to take the openings where That's they emerge. That's right. I, I don't blame you. Well, wanted to uh, really spend the last segment to... Uh, uh, kind of do a year in review and uh, the various things that Vala for Colorado has done. And um, um, one of the first things I really wanted to talk about, and I don't think this has been publicized very much, uh, but there's been a program in Colorado that I think has been going on at least since 2005, perhaps four, uh, called the Bighorn Leadership Program. And uh, that is a uh, program uh, where people are brought together, and, and these are uh, influential people all throughout the state, usually a, a group or a cohort of 30, 35 people. And uh, this leadership program has tackled uh, health care issues and transportation issues and uh, uh, funding issues for education. And this year, we we're uh, lucky enough to be able to partner with uh, the Big Horn Leadership Program at the University of Colorado at Denver and uh, to have a leadership program on energy uh, this fall, it was uh, two days on September, October, November, and just December. Um, so I wanted to talk about that, John, a little bit. I, I think you're right that there hasn't been that much coverage in it, and Bighorn is unique in that it brings people of all political stripes together to talk in a fact-based and policy-based way about issues of great complexity that are important to the public dialogue. Uh, and f there is nothing, especially given what we tackled in our last segment regarding Broomfield, there is nothing at the forefront of everyone's minds quite like energy development. So getting together the group that we have, I think, has been incredibly valuable. And I say that we partner with, we uh, partner with a particular uh, Brenda Morrison and Chris Adams. Uh, and who Jim Marshury partners uh, of a company called Engage Public, and uh, Brenda and Chris, I think, have been involved in uh, the Big Horn Leadership Program since the very beginning. Um, so they're just great people, and they brought, I think, uh, 30, 35 people together, uh, and I think we had two mayors and eight or nine people that work for state and city government, a uh, newspaper publisher that I uh, know participated, and a few political candidates. We had one, one fellow that uh, uh, toward the end of the uh, session we kept on asking him, are you running for office? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but these are uh, people from all around the state and uh, nonpartisan in the sense that we didn't uh, choose them or um, engage public really didn't choose them because they ran the program Right. Uh, um, on the basis of anything other than there are people that, that want to learn and want to know. And, and, and the mission, from my point of view, is to improve the level of discourse, to improve the discussion by improving the content and the information available to those that are speaking about important issues of policy. Well, Peter, you attended the sessions personally. Yeah. Uh, what were your takeaways? I, how, how did it unfold for you? Well, I'm a real fan, obviously. Uh, um, Certainly. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a reader, and I... I like college and like graduate school, like law school, and uh, I felt like I was going back to college. So before I went <laughs> down uh, for each session, I asked my wife if I had the, the right college outfit on. Um, were you uh, wearing pajama pants? Because no, then because I, I, I actually wore uh, this outfit. So I have a, a, a jacket with, uh, the with elbow uh, oh, you got the elbow patches <laughs> with the elbow <laughs> patches <laughs> on. And, Very studious. Uh, and. Uh, uh, but there were people that were directly involved in energy policy from the state of Colorado, nationally, from the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, from the Department of Energy. Wow. Uh, there were academics. Uh, people were uh, explaining energy economics. Uh, they came from the university. Uh, pe people came from, uh, um, from the uh, state university to talk about the energy laboratory in uh, Fort Collins. Oh, yeah, and yeah. I thought it was pretty knowledgeable, but I had no idea all that they're doing. Uh, so it, it was just uh, fantastic information. And I think we really uh, uh, brought a lot to the uh, people that uh, participated and hopefully provided them much more context and information and uh, taught them a little bit about some of the uh, methodologies of thinking about policy and things you need to think about. Right. Uh, we have people from Excel talking talk about the money and 
the economics of setting regulatory rates and the process. Well, that was Alice Jackson, right? Yeah. And she was on our previous show two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. She was. Uh, and she is incredibly knowledgeable. Oh, wow. Which, I mean, what for people to have Alice talk about those issues as a captive audience, I mean, you're not going to get better insight than that, I don't think. Right. And, and also, uh, somebody from private industry, uh, she was actually arguing on the other side of the fence, these rate cases, and I think eventually XL Energy looked across the table right. at who they're talking with and said, we need her. Yeah, yep. you should and, work for us instead and, of us and, defending uh, ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I thought it was great, and um, uh, we also had uh, Jim Marchiori of the University of Colorado at Denver, um, and I knew about this, but I didn't realize the depth of it, the... Uh, the Global Energy Program is called the GEM Program, and, mm-hmm. and uh, it's really is a gem for the state of Colorado. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and very other people. Uh, uh, David, Hiller, uh, David Hiller came, and he had been involved. He's a lawyer, mm-hmm. and I have known him for an awful long time, but uh, he was involved um, with something called the Colorado Collaboratory in Clean Tech Industries. Uh, so this really brought a lot of disciplines together. So that's one of the... Uh, Great things, I think, that uh, we will uh, partner on, and, and uh, the net result is uh, 30, 35 people that are uh, leaders, and hopefully they'll, they'll be able to uh, uh, talk about the program to their network and, and improve the discussion overall. That's our hope. Well, it certainly speaks to Vital 7 Principle Pledge, right? As we support rational energy policy, as we support all of the above energy strategies, talking about issues of public complexity and public importance in a venue such as this I think is invaluable because those folks help carry the message forward and perhaps we elevate the dialogue that way. Well, uh, I'm such a big um, fan that I hope to do it again. We have to go through our budgeting and have to Certainly. go out and fight for dollars and find dollars for this again uh, for next year. But uh, to me, uh, the Big Current Leisure Program was was actually completely emblematic of uh, the fundamental principles of uh, Vada for Colorado. 100%. Which is uh, rational energy discussion, all the above energy, and appreciate all of the nuances that are necessary uh, to keep the energy system and to try to um, stay away from the we versus they dichotomy and all of that in politics, which is an awful lot of fun to create (laughs) A big bogeyman over here and say that you're on the side of God over here and right. they're terrible and you're great and that's not real life no it certainly isn't and in our last couple of minutes here because we don't have much time left taking that spirit I think speaks to vital sponsored a luncheon at the Koga annual conference and we had and Koga is the Colorado Oil and Gas Con- uh, Association Association correct and uh, we had senators Michael Bennett and Corey Gardner there and great lunch and t- um, terrific uh, dialogue there Peter can you share your insights from that because I think people are a little bit dispirited by the partisanship and the us versus them dialogue what was your takeaway from Senators Bennett and Gardner well if if, if you had been there uh, you would realize and also uh, Lieutenant Governor Donna Lynn also was there she was actually the person that introduced um, the uh, who introduced the two senators uh, I, I know for a fact that the two senators uh, talked about convergence of ideas. They talked about their commonality in terms of security, their understanding of the importance of the economics. Uh, they even talked about liquid, uh, I guess, liquefied natural gas, LNG, which is right. so important to the Western Slope and the Jordan Cove pro- uh, project. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were asked, uh, because the press was there and, and uh, Lieutenant Governor Lynn was the moderator asking questions, and uh, they were, um, actually there was somebody else that also was a moderator, I guess she just introduced. Correct. Uh, um, she was a newspaper person, I don't recall. I, I can't remember off the top of my head who it was. Like Wall Street Journal or something right. like that. Uh, but those two senators were, in essence, in common with regard to their viewpoint toward energy, and I often think if you would take the politics out of these discussions and just would allow the people in charge to, to talk, uh, that you would de-escalate much of the fight mm-hmm. and we would just sort of focus on rational solutions, which Pe- is what we're advocating. Uh, Peter, I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, vital for Colorado. Uh, 
had had a very very busy year and we thank you for your leadership and your stewardship and we look forward to a uh, very busy and hopefully successful 2018. Thanks a lot John. And thank you both for for joining us today here on Connect and Collaborate. We love having Vital for Colorado as one of our regular partners with the Colorado Business Roundtable and we'll see you again next year. Thank you.